and welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap between fitness professionals and our medical community. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And we've made it to episode 53 in examining the wellness paradox, which means, given that we publish our podcast weekly, uh, this is officially the start of year two. And this is going to be a different episode, and I hope it's going to be a special episode for all of you because the guest in this conversation will be me. Uh, I've learned a lot during this first 52 weeks of hosting the Wellness Paradox. And and in this uh, short conversation relative to all the great conversations I've had, uh, now nearing, I guess, over 500 hours of conversations on the Wellness Paradox, that I'm gonna try to summarize what I've learned. I wanna look back on the first year and I wanna look forward into the second year in terms of what we're going to be doing with the wellness paradox. Before I dive into all of that, I first have to say an amazing thank you, first and foremost, to the School of Kinesiology at University of Michigan uh, that allows me to backstop this podcast with the Block M. It's not lost on me that the reason that I have so many amazing guests on this podcast is because of the strength of the University of Michigan brand. Uh, The second group I'd like to acknowledge are all of you, our listeners. Uh, It's also not lost on me that there are many, many podcasts out there, and we do have a relatively large and loyal listenership, and I'm so incredibly grateful for that. I, I cannot tell you what it means to know that there are people that are listening to this that view their mission very similar to my mission. Of course, I have to thank all of the amazing guests we've had this past year, from Tom Rafai on our first episode uh, to Barry Franklin on the episode last week. Uh, We've just had such such an amazing group of guests who are, are brilliant, who are passionate, and who are really willing to share their time, their energy, and their expertise with me. And with all of you, and to each and every one of those guests, I thank you. I, this podcast would be far too long if I named all of you and all the reasons that I thank each and every one of you. But you've all contributed to my understanding of what needs to be done to solve the wellness paradox. So, so thank you to all of you. Now, I want to get into this conversation. I've learned a lot this past year. This has been a, a fascinating anxious and exciting year for me all at the same time. And you know, sometimes I refer to you know, anxiety and excitement as, as two sides of the same coin. It's just a matter of the, the perspective that you look at things through. And, and I'll say this, I started out the wellness paradox with the goal of talking to the most brilliant minds in our field, you know, have that be you know, fitness or medicine or allied health, to solve what I consider to be the most prominent public health crisis of our time. And that is the crisis of the lack of prevention that exists in our healthcare system. I've said this many times, with all due respect to healthcare, because I think they do the most amazing job under the constraints they're placed on, we do not truly have a healthcare system in this country. We have a disease management system in this country. And if we're ever going to get out from under the epidemic of you know, chronic disease and, and morbidity that we face as a society, and if we're ever going to address public health, and if we're ever going to hope to address the economic calamity that is our healthcare system, keeping in mind the U.S. spends about 17.5% of its gross domestic product every year on healthcare, if we're ever going to get out from under that, which has us spending more than twice any other industrialized nation on the globe, we have to switch to a preventative model. That was the that was the problem that I set out to solve, not just with this podcast, but I've been trying to solve this problem on some level or another for the entirety of my 23 year career in the fitness and wellness industry. And when I set out to solve this this big hairy problem that we have, which many other people are trying to solve, my lever 
that I wanted to pull to effectuate that change and solve that problem was putting fitness professionals on the front lines of healthcare. And I truly believe fitness professionals are the front lines of healthcare. And that's one of the lessons I've learned throughout the course of this year. And with all due respect to the traditional frontline healthcare providers, you know, nurses and ER doctors and, and other people that are, work on the traditional front lines, I would call those providers the front lines of the back lines, because they're the front line provider uh, when illness has already occurred, when disease already exists, when you know morbidity is ubiquitous, where mortality is eminent. And while those are important constituents in our healthcare delivery system, we need to figure out a way to get upstream from that point. And so we need to think of the front line of the front lines and that I believe to be fitness and wellness professionals. But as we've established with the paradox, although those professionals are there, um, they aren't communicating effectively with the proper stakeholders in the medical, medical community to really effectuate a difference. And that's where getting answers to the paradox from all these amazing experts has allowed me to start to at least understand the silhouette of what needs to happen to make this a reality. And I think back to my episode with, with John Berardi, the former founder of, or the founder of Precision Nutrition, former CEO of Precision Nutrition. And I remember I asked him the question, what do we need to do to address the wellness paradox? And, and, and Dr. Berardi stepped me dead in my tracks when he said, I don't know if you're going to address that in your lifetime. You just may have to be okay with passing the baton to the next generation. And I have tremendous respect and admiration for Dr. Berardi. And it was not the answer I was expecting, but it, it was an amazingly genuine and honest answer. And he was basically saying to me, you know, Mike, this is a, an amazing problem to solve. And it's going to take a while to solve it. So it's not lost on me that this is not something that one season or two seasons of the wellness paradox is going to be able to solve. But I feel like we're moving the needle in the right direction because I'm starting to get consistent answers from various stakeholders in the, the health and wellness ecosystem, have that be healthcare, fitness, wellness, and all points in between. And it's starting to coalesce around this this vision that can be operationalized to connect fitness with healthcare and truly make fitness professionals those frontline healthcare providers. So with that being said, I want to talk about what I learned. And, you know, in the interest of not having this be a, a 50 hour episode, I want to summarize what some of our amazing guests have talked about during the course of this first year of our recordings. And I'm gonna start pretty high level and then we're gonna to try to get a little bit more granular and actionable as we go. Look, if nothing else, if you don't wanna go back through and re-listen to all 52 of our episodes, which I completely understand, I recorded them and I wouldn't wanna do that either, then hopefully this provides a good summary for you. The first thing I really think I learned was the need for our profession to change their, their mindset and their approach. Our profession, our industry, the fitness industry, fitness professionals, it's, it's time to realize the errors of our past. It's, it's time to realize that on, on a lot of levels, we are the cause of the wellness paradox. We are the cause of the disconnect. You know, I think back to my episodes with Michelle Seeger and my episode with Amy Bantham and how they talked about this need to be very, very conscious around the language that we use, the imagery that we've used. And I think that's the first thing that sticks out to me is we aren't, broadly speaking, as an industry using inclusive and safe language, inclusive and safe imagery that attracts that broader population that we need to engage with us if we are going to, one, address population health, two, address the economic crisis in our healthcare system, and three, even sustain a viable industry coming out of COVID. And what I mean by safe and inclusive messaging and language is, first off, moving away from things like the gym or even the term exercise. Now, I realize some of you are listening to this and going, Mike, you're crazy. We go to the gym to work out. And when we're in the gym working out, we're doing exercise. What are you talking about? 
Well, what I'm talking about is 20% of the population that is like you who are listening right now love words like the gym and exercise. The other 80% of the population that doesn't want to step foot in a fitness center, doesn't want to even think about exercise, and in fact thinks exercise isn't for them, uh, those are not approachable words in the least. And then take it a step further to the imagery we use as an industry, you know, chiseled abs, hard bodies, you know, ads about getting jacked and ripped and great glutes and great arms. And while some of us are listening to this going, that's great, that's what I want, it's not the 80% of the people that don't engage with our industry and don't engage with our professionals. And so we have to really ask ourselves: is the definition of insanity truly doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? And in our industry, it, it is absolutely the case. You know, I think about my good friend, Doug Rivley, who spent 25 years at the Cleveland Clinic. He wasn't a podcast guest uh, in our first season. I can promise you he's coming up in our second season. And you know, Doug always tells a story about how 40 years ago, he was sitting in a boardroom meeting with some of the top executives in our industry. We're talking the, the executives that ran all of the major health club chains at the time. And they said, we're only attracting 15 to 20% of the American population. We need to do something about it. And then Doug continues the story to say, fast forward 40 years later, I'm sitting in a different boardroom in a different meeting with different executives from slightly different companies in most cases, because the industry landscape had changed. And they're saying the same thing. We're only attracting 15 to 20% of the population. We have to do something different. And that has to start with our language, it has to start with our imagery, it, it absolutely has to become more inclusive. And what that means in, in operational forms, a little bit beyond the scope of this conversation, but I think broadly speaking, one of the first take home messages that I have for all of you from this first season of the wellness paradox is we have to really critically analyze what we're saying. Is there a way for language to become more approachable? Can we call it movement or physical activity rather than exercise? Can we figure out a way to bring in the joyful component? Again, I, I go back to Michelle Seeger in her book, The Joy Choice. Uh, you know, can we figure out a way to have imagery that's more inclusive? You know, can we have normal people exercising rather than jacked fitness models? And if you think that that's not a problem, just think for a second, if you are, put yourself in the shoes of the person who is you know, 45 years old, a BMI of 35 to 40, has really not done any exercise since high school. And they're looking at an advertisement. I don't care if it's a television advertisement, social media, print, whatever it is. They're looking at an advertisement. And they only see hard jacked bodies in that ad. The first thing they are going to think, it's not, oh, that's so aspirational. That's a place I want to be. And that we're kidding ourselves if we think that that is what those people are thinking. They're looking at that ad and they're looking at those people and they're going, wow, that is definitely not a place for me. Because if people look like that there, I don't look like that. I don't fit in. And of course, they're going to have an adverse reaction to wanting to be in our environments. So our, our, our imagery needs to be more inclusive. Our language needs to be more inclusive. We need to stop using terms like boot camp. Like boot camp has the most negative connotation on the planet to the vast majority of people. Right? It's a term that gets used a lot, but you know, what is it doing? It's, it's attractive to the 20% of the population we're already serving. And if we're fine with just serving that 20%, then, then keep using that terminology. But I don't think we are. I think we're in it to make a difference for everybody. And so we have to start using different terms. We have to throw away the gym. The, the gym cannot be a word that's used anymore. I've learned that so many times during this first year of the wellness paradox. Think about high school gym class and not your experience, because I bet your experience was a positive experience. That's why you're in this industry. Think about your friends that did everything in their power to get out of gym class. They they decided that they were sick or they stood in the back. I mean, how many people have just these viscerally negative memories of the gym. Like, let's start to change the, the language here. This is why you hear me talk in terms of health and fitness centers. Amy Bantham uh, it talks about this so well in her episode. It just, she, she nails it when she says that. And then I think we even have to go a step further in terms of our hiring practices. You know, we need more diverse you know, shapes, sizes, and looks in our facilities. I used to believe uh, on some level that you can only hire fit fitness professionals. 
And then as time went on, I started to realize that by doing that, I was creating a, a staff that, although they looked like they were in incredible shape, uh, were completely disconnected from the realities of our, our client base. And our clients would walk in and look at our staff and go, these people don't get me. They're, they're nothing like me. Look at the shape they're in. And now I'm not saying we should go out of our way to hire you know, overweight, out of shape people at our industry. In fact, you know, I think that that would be you know, relatively hard and, and daunting. I mean, you add that into the current job market, maybe impossible. But what I'm saying is, is that maybe don't discount somebody. Uh, you know, I think of Kelsey Ward's recent podcast, Your Body Isn't Your Business Card. And I think that's so true. And, you know, that came up on the on the uh, Kirsten Sonneville podcast as well, where we're talking about weight stigma and your, your body is not your business card in this industry. It's what you can do and how you can truly help people. And if you don't believe me, I, I have a, a guy who works for me who's worked for me for 11 years and his superpower is making everyone feel tremendously comfortable the second they meet him. And he is my in, most in demand and most highly compensated employee in my organization as a trainer. And his BMI is not in the healthy range. It's definitely in the overweight range. And he has a superpower of making people feel comfortable. Part of that is his personality, but part of it is his look. He is not in the best physical shape from a body composition perspective. He actually happens to have a very, very high level of fitness and, and cardiometabolic health, but his body composition is higher. And people look at him and they don't think, oh, look at that guy. He's overweight. He can't help me. They look at him and they go, wow, that, that person has some of the same struggles that I have. And I think that person might be able to help me. What a, what a profound, what a profound thought. So I think, you know, when we start to get into this discussion a little bit more here of what I've learned through the first year, I, I think, you know, we have to understand that fundamentally speaking, these, these three tenets exist. We're no longer you know, gyms or even fitness centers. We're healthcare facilities. That's how we have to view ourselves. Uh, we're no longer fitness professionals. We are healthcare practitioners. Fundamentally, we are the front line of healthcare in this country. And that is something we have to embrace. And we have to embrace everything that goes along with that if we are going to bridge this gap, that really, really is the wellness paradox. And before we start to zoom in a little bit more, I'll say this, I, I picture in my mind's eye, this, this image that I've had throughout my entire career. And it's really been crystallized in the past, I would say five years or so. I feel like I'm standing outside of an operating room with somebody on an operating table getting ready to die because of things related to their chronic conditions. And in my pocket, I have the answer. I have the cure to what ails that person. I have you know, lifestyle medicine, if you will, physical activity, nutrition, sleep hygiene, stress management, smoke cessation. I, I got that in my pocket. Maybe I don't have it all myself, but I have a network of people uh, that I have access to that have it. It's, it's right there in my pocket. And I'm just pounding on the door of that operating room, trying to get in and take this thing on my pocket and say, here it is. And that door's locked that I've never been able to get in. And I've also not really understood what I need to do to get through that door. I'm now starting to understand. And I think other people are starting to understand. And it's so encouraging. And, and if you're sitting here shaking your head as I gave you that metaphor of just you know, sitting there and watching someone that you care about, uh, you know, have it be you know, a client, a friend, a family member, someone in your community you know, die because they're not getting access to healthcare, they're getting access to disease management, then I think that this, this fight that as John Berardi talks about is going to be a long uphill challenging battle. I think you start to realize how worth it every challenge is in that fight and in that struggle. So, you know, how, how do we do this? Well, we have to think top down first. I mean, major changes in this country happen because of, of top down, you know, policy oriented interventions. And I'm going to pull in multiple things here. Certainly the only thing I don't do is, is the wellness paradox. I do many other things and I have a chance to talk to, to many people. And, and the first 
thing that I want to touch on, which gets brought up on the podcast, but also gets brought up in some of my other conversations, is the idea of education and certification. And I was having a recent conversation with Francis Narek, who's the head of certification for the American College of Sport Medicine. And Francis brings up a great point. In no other field of allied health do you have such a fragmented education system. Uh, in the fitness industry, you have certifications and they are numerous and they are plentiful. Some are very, very academically rigorous, ACSM, you know, NSCA, ACE, others, and I don't even know the names of these, you literally go online, you pay your money, you take a test and you pass the test and you are a certified fitness professional. And there are more of those certifications out there than there are the ACSMs, NSCAs and ACEs of the world. And because of that, there's just this overall lack of trust that exists in the, the credentialing or education system. And then you carry that a step further and you say, okay, well, Mike, that's, that's certification. And, and, you know, people need to get degrees and have certifications. And I could not agree more. I, I teach at a university and that's actually, you know, one of the things I'm very passionate about. But then let's think of the education system we have for fitness and exercise professionals in this country. Unlike any other form of allied health, there is no standardization and uniformity in curricula across the country. Meaning you could be a student at University of Michigan and get a degree in applied exercise science and kinesiology. And then you could be a student at San Diego State University and get a degree in the same thing or something that's named similar. And you'll come out with the same degree, but the competencies that you will come out possessing will be different because there is no standardization and there is no at least broad-based accreditation to exercise science programs across the country. And that's a problem. Like just imagine for a second, and this, this is Francis's metaphor and I, I could not agree more. Just imagine for a second, if nurses or doctors uh, all came out of their schooling with different competencies and different abilities, that would be a completely untenable situation. Can you just imagine a nurse going to University of Michigan and a nurse going to San Diego State University and coming out knowing vastly, vastly different things and then coming out into an ecosystem of, of post-education, post-academic education credentialing that is as fragmented and broad as what we have in our industry? This is, this is a non-starter to be part of public health folks, to be part of the medical community, this is a non-starter. We absolutely need to have great credentialing post-academic learning, but we also need curricula that are collaborated with and accredited with these credentialing organizations, just like medical schools do, like nursing schools do, like public health schools do, like physical therapy and athletic trainers. We do have a proxy for this. In, in and around the fitness ecosystem. It is, you know, the NATA and the APTA, the National Athletic Trainers Association, the American Physical Therapy Association. They do this, it's right there. Uh, we just need to start coming together and realize that's something that has to happen. Uh, healthcare policy needs to change. You know, we need to start having conversations with lawmakers around the critically important role that fitness professionals and lifestyle medicine play in disease prevention and then management. It just has to happen. Now, on some level, you got to follow the money. And whenever I talk about this conversation of you know, fitness professionals are healthcare providers and they need to be treated as such, the first thing I'll hear people tell me is, well, how are we going to pay for that? There isn't reimbursement for that right now. And we're never going to get reimbursement for that. Well, first off, it's not like there isn't reimbursement for it because there are strikingly good reasons why there shouldn't be. Certainly what I just said about, you know, credentialing, accreditation, you know, academic learning needs to be taken into consideration. But, you know, on some level, if you think about the study of exercise and even our field as an academic venture, it's relatively in its infancy. I mean, it's, it's not, but probably 60, 65 years ago that uh, Kenneth Cooper of the Cooper Institute in Dallas, Texas, uh, was talking about people going out and running to improve their aerobic fitness. And 
he was basically he was he was called a heretic he almost lost his license to practice and all the things that he said a very very long time ago when he published that first book aerobics all of those things have turned out to be absolutely true. And so I think, you know, uh, there's a paradigm exists and a way of thinking exists until it doesn't anymore. And Cooper, he was a disruptor and you know, we need disruptors right now. And here's the amazing thing. We're at a point and, you know, David Katz way back in episode five, and wow, I mean, if you haven't listened to the David Katz episode, I, I can't remember if it was episode five. It was one of our early, early episodes. Uh, one of the most eloquent you know, public health and medical professionals I've ever heard talk. I was just mesmerized by our conversation. And what he said in that episode, and he's gonna, he worded way more eloquently than I'm about to word it. But basically, he said, this is the first time in modern human history that chronic diseases led to acute mortality. Chronic disease led to acute mortality. And what did he mean by that? Well, basically he meant that this is the first time where diabetes wasn't going to kill you in 30, 40, 50 years. Diabetes could kill you today because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Obesity, something that is not great today, but at the in the end of life can really result in early mortality. But again, 20, 30, 40 years down the line with COVID, we know that being obese exponentially increased your risk of severe disease or even mortality. And, and, and as Katz makes that point in that episode, I, I, can't, I can't but think of the Winston Churchill quote, don't waste a good crisis. You know, we have this amazing public health crisis before us right now. And we as an industry could take advantage of this. Lawmakers are paying attention. Uh, thanks to the amazing work of URSA at the national level and then work at the state level by state alliances, uh, we do now have a seat at the table with lawmakers, but we need a louder voice. Uh, we need more seats and we need bigger seats and we need better seats at the table. And that's not gonna happen by being quiet. The squeaky wheel always gets the grease as they say, and we don't need to squeak. Uh, we need to yell if we're going to make this a reality. I think we, as an industry, again, you know, thinking you know, broadly in terms of messaging, we need to think of, of healthy lifestyle more broadly than just exercise or, or even movement. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're one in amongst many professionals on the allied health continuum. And I've learned that throughout the course of this year with all the amazing people that I've talked to. You know, I, I think of talking to you know, Kate Collins of the American uh, College of Lifestyle Medicine. You know, I think of Allison Mankowski, you know, as, as a dietitian. I think of Stephen Hayes, and I think of John Evans as mental health professionals. And just all of these, these great professionals in other fields that, you know, we need to collaborate with in order to just be one additional arm, or as, as the ACL, ACLM, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine will put it, uh, one additional pillar to leading a overall healthy lifestyle. So we need to broaden our perspective. I think that's one thing I, I, I've learned uh, during the course of this year. And I think we really need to collaborate, intensely collaborate. And Collaboration is the only way we're going to make this happen. Uh, to a great extent, a lot of us are, are yelling into our own silos and it's reverberating back off the ceiling right back onto us. What if we all came together? What if we came together with a unified message? And that's something that I'm trying to do with the wellness paradox. I'm trying to unify the message to the extent that I possibly can. So, you know, greater, greater collaboration. Like, like Kate Collins in episode 21, Clay Summers with Parks and Rec in episode 31. We mentioned Allison, the RD. I'd say, you know, even you know, look at Ari Levy in episode 49, talking about his practice shift and what a, what a profound difference it can make if we, we collaborate. Now, as I, we talk about collaboration, this starts to transition us into the, the bottom up approach to this. Again, massive problems need a multifactorial solution to them. And I view this, you know, top down and bottom up. And again, top down is, you know, education and certification, healthcare policy, you know, broadening our messaging, more inclusive, more safe, but, but bottom up, this is stuff that, that you as listeners, you can do right now. I realize everything I just said from a top down standpoint takes time and it's painful and it's a slog and it's, it's healthcare and it's government. So it is, it is slower than glacial in some cases. 
uh, but it is what it is. I think bottom up, like this is stuff you can do today. And, and, you know, I, I think of Barry Franklin in our most recent episode and, and I love Barry and he's just, he's such an inspiring visionary in our field. And you know, I don't even have, you know, time in three episodes to talk about all the stuff that Barry's done to advance our field. But I had that conversation with him and he said something to me and it, it, it so resonates with me in my life. The, you want to make a change in this world, take action, get moving. I mean, we're a profession that encourages people to get moving. Well, you got to take action. So I think, you know, if you're, if you're passionate about this, like I am, and you want to make a difference, I, I think it is a very ill-conceived notion to say, well, you know, th this is several years off. You know, I'm just going to let the environment materialize and then I'll step in. I kind of think that's a cop-out with all due respect. I think you want to make a difference you can take action. So, you know, what, what actions, you know, can you take like you as the listener right now? And we're going to have this conversation for about another 10, 15 minutes. And, and, and I want to send you away with some actionable takeaways from year one. And, you know, if you do nothing else from this conversation, hopefully you haven't shut it off by now because it's just me blithering on. But if you do nothing else from this conversation, I really, really hope that you find one thing that you can take action on. Just one thing and do it. I mean, just get moving. We, we tell this to the people we work with all the time. You know, it's the journey of, of a thousand miles starts with the first step. You, you got to take the first step. And you know, what could some of those be? Well, I think our guests have taught us these lessons during the course of the year. I think, you know, I go back to, you know, Amy Bantham episode 33, and then we had a great conversation around, you know, making, you know, fitness facilities, you know, trusted community resources. And so trust, trust, it starts with building trust. And there's a lot that's involved with building trust. You know, it, it certainly is, you know, being a good human being at your core, but it's about being competent, and meeting expectations and doing whatever we can to bridge that trust gap. I think fundamentally, it's also being humble. So I think humility is something that we really need to consider as a field. And if you're wondering how we're doing with facility, uh, excuse me, humility, broadly speaking, uh, just get on Instagram and look at the Instagram influencers in our field right now and, and ask yourself how humble of a field, you know, are we really? And how likely is that physician going to be to want to collaborate with the guy or the gal on YouTube that is taking a, you know, a guy who's taking a shirtless pick flexing, you know, or a girl who's, you know, got her glutes out there for the entire world to see, like, you know, how humble is that? And how is that connecting with these, these other allied health professionals that we want to work with, you know, getting and focusing on appropriate professional development, John Berardi, episode 23, uh, talking about his book, Change Maker and the Change Maker Academy, man, what an amazing developmental framework uh, that people have access to. We have to be evidence-based with regard to, you know, special populations. We absolutely have to be, you know, think of, you know, Kate Collins episode 21, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine conversation. My great friend, Jeff Young, is going to be on again, you know, in, in the uh, near future here, you know, talking about making uh, medical fitness a health system-wide reality. Uh, Monica Regnagel in episode 43, talking kind of broadly about how to work with individuals who are overweight. Understanding psychology and coaching, you know, Margaret Moore from episode three, Stephen Hayes from episode five, John Evans, episode 25, Akai Jackson in episode 36, and just the, the conversation around psychology and, and coaching and, and the importance of mental health. I mean, it, it's all right there right now. Again, you don't got to implement 10 of these. Just find one thing that resonates with you. Go back, listen to that episode, and then try to implement something. Man, the lessons of being business minded, you know, so, so, so important. We've said it so many times on this podcast, and I have, I have many of our great guests to thank, and I'll, I'll highlight their episodes in a second. But if you don't have money from what you're doing, if you don't make money, you don't have a business or a job, you have a hobby, and you're not going to be doing it for very long. I think of Josh Levy in episode 18, uh, Lily Allen Duenas in episode 28, uh, when we talked about Instagram, you know, Adam Shaper from Mind Pump uh, doing a great job in episode 29, talking about how to build value in your services. 
you know, Luke Carlson in episode 34 from Discover Strength talking about leadership. And we had uh, Mark Morris in episode 37, Vanessa Severiano in episode 42. And, you know, we even had, you know, Diane Boyce in episode 44 that talked about lessons from the, the venture innovation technology world. And man, just so many great lessons on how to be business minded. And, and that's not a, it's not a dirty, dirty phrase. Like we have to make money if we are going to have a sustainable impact on population health. And and so we have to be business minded to do so. If you haven't listened to episode 27 with, uh, uh, with Kendra Sonneville uh, about weight stigma, please listen to that episode. It is, it really gets to the heart of, of the safety element that I talked about earlier and really understanding our conscious and our unconscious, more importantly, biases towards individuals and bigger bodies. And again, I think I love the episode of, or the title of episode 50 with, with Kelsey Ward, your body isn't your business card. It's, it, it's so, so, so true. Then we had this, this notion of kind of broadening your perspective. And I think, you know, Amy Bantham, you know, in episode 33, Michelle Seeger in episode 35 specifically, but also her Joy Choice episode recently, you know, Debbie Bellager in episode 38, and then Tony Moreno in episode 40 talking about physical literacy. Uh, just taking a, a zoomed out view of this ecosystem that we're normally very, very, you know, zoomed in and granular with and, and listening to those episodes and, and truly, truly understanding um, what it takes to look at this from a, a macroscopic perspective rather than just a microscopic perspective. And it's, it's shifting, shifting your perspective uh, on some great level. So a lot of great lessons to be learned in year one, uh, a tremendous number of great lessons. And again, I'm grateful to all of these guests. Certainly, you know, I, I couldn't talk about every guest in every single episode if, if I wanted to be respectful of all of your times, but I don't know what it is that is going to resonate with you the most. I don't know if it's top down. I don't know if it's bottom up. I don't know if it's somewhere in between, but I truly hope, you know, as as you heard this conversation that I had with you today, that there's something that sticks out to you that you can act on today. Uh, If we do not start acting, uh, we are not going to make the difference that we want to make. And, And this is the time, you know, David Katz said it, you know, a chronic diseases, led to acute mortality. Winston Churchill reminds us, do not waste a good crisis. You know, now's the time. So with that said, year two, you know, we're coming into year two. And in case you can't tell, I am as excited and motivated and passionate about this as I am the day that we started. And year number two is going to be, I think, better than year number one. I've certainly learned a lot during the course of this past 12 months. And I think it's going to inform my strategy and my decision-making as we go into year number two, we're going to bring back some guests from year one, man, uh, the lineup I had was amazing. I, on some level, I think I could just rotate through these 52 guests, you know, year after year after year, and they would be providing value to you all the time. So we're going to bring back guests from year one into year two. Uh, We're going to have new guests. We're really going to try to stay on top of not just the latest research in the quote unquote fitness field, but we want to make sure we're, we're keeping true to our mission of, you know, being very, very broad in all of the evidence basis for addressing the wellness paradox. And, and, you know, that means, that means healthcare policy. That means talking about, you know, education, credentialing, accreditation. Yeah, and that certainly means, you know, talking about the latest research that is, is actionable to you in your practice as you know, fitness and wellness professionals. Uh, I'm very excited about year number two, but I'm also uh, humble enough to realize that I don't have all the answers. And so this is where I want to make a plea to you as our loyal listeners, that if there are things that you want to hear about, guests that you may want to have on the podcast, conversations you'd like us to be having, just reach out to me via email. You can either do it through the contact form on our website, wellnessparadoxpod.com, or you can just shoot me an email at mike at wellnessparadoxpod.com. And I'll be happy to get back with you. I'll be happy to have a conversation, to listen to your considerations, and, and to really make this podcast into what you need it to be for you. Uh, This is not for me. This is for solving this big, massive healthcare challenge that we have in this country. Uh, And I know it's a mission that all of you share because you listen to this podcast. 
And if it's not helping to fulfill your educational needs and help you move closer to achieving those goals and to achieving this broader mission, then I need to know about it. And we need to figure out a way to better meet your needs as an audience. I have amazing resources at my disposal. I have amazing reach at my disposal, largely because of the affiliation with the University of Michigan. So let's leverage that. Let's leverage that as a community of learners that are on the same journey to make this, this profound and substantive difference in the health of our nation. So with all of that said, again, I want to thank each and every one of you for being a loyal listener uh, to this podcast during this first year. It was an absolutely amazing journey. I've enjoyed every conversation I've had on air and off air. I'm incredibly grateful to all of our guests. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to our podcast, please take the time to do so through your favorite podcast platform. And leaving reviews for our podcast does make a massive difference that helps in the algorithm on all the podcast platforms. The higher you rate us, the more people will come across our podcast organically. And I know you all believe in this message. So if you could, please take the time to leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. We would greatly appreciate that. And then finally, you know, my plea to you is to share this you know, with your friends and colleagues. Uh, that's the best way that people can get exposed to this as, as a direct referral from somebody like you that really, really believes in this. Well, I thank you tremendously and from the bottom of my heart for you know, being a part of this journey with me this past 12 months. You know, we are the front lines of healthcare in this country. We are frontline fitness professionals. And in year number two, we're going to move a little bit closer to solving this complex problem that is the wellness paradox. Until we chat again next week, please be well.